you know this? Do you know what this video is about? No. Painting the car. Oh no. And fitting the engine. Now, you guys aren't in this video, do you know why? Because we're too awesome! No. Because I'm using chemicals and I want to keep you safe. I've only got one mask. Anyway, that's what it's about. Bye. Yep, it's done. Thanks. That's all. <laughs> yep. Now, I'm not a painter. I'm sort of self-taught and I have asked questions um, before on how to do this sort of thing. I came around three bits of wet and dry, a bit of baby grit to get filler down to the shape I wanted. Um, then I go for the 120 and then of course there's some 240. And when you're getting into places like this, you sort of tend to use any implement you can. And this is quite a sharp transition. You've got to make sure you don't scratch unnecessarily. And you can sort of use these implements to get a nice tight bend in there or a tight corner and sort of finish off. Um, the idea is you're not to feel it. If you shut your eyes and run your fingers along, you shouldn't be able to feel anything that shouldn't be there. This is where spending and taking a lot of time will really yield a great result at the end. Sometimes it's easier to pop the door open so you can get to the edges. You can see here where I've been circling uh, with a pencil. Sometimes it takes a few applications to, to get it exactly the way you want to do it. So you sort of circle them and use a quick stop putty, which is a single pack um, putty in a tube. Um, once you get it how you want it, and it feels all good, which that does, um, I always just tick them off. And that way when you go over, particularly if you've got about 20 repairs in the car like this one, you can go over them, you can see exactly where you've been. I don't think the graphite affects the um, primer or edge primer, but I always rub it out before I start. Once I'm finished doing the bodywork, I'll rub it out, um, and then when I'm ready to, to prime, I go over it. Now, a lot of people panic when they see filler, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with using it. Um, some sticklers like everything metal finish, but in metal finishing, you actually end up with all the grinding, thinning out your steel and all the rest of it. I'd say just use a very, very light application. Some things are a little bit too light for a, a, a normal two-pack filler, uh, which is the conventional automotive filler, which you need to add a hardener to. There's this fine filler here. Let's call it quick stop putty. I don't know what they call it now. Basically, it's in a tube. You just take a tiny bit out onto an applicator and just fill over those sorts of marks, and you can just sand that off. It dries fairly quickly. And the other thing you can do before your filler completely goes off is you can just sort of cut it and uh, slice off when you're not going to use and sand it later. It just makes it so much easier to sand later on makes your job a lot easier um, and easy to finish off but if you get to it quickly then you can do this sort of thing because once it really goes off you'll never ever be able to cut it like that so with any body work you're attempting to do always seek the advice of a qualified professional um, I am not a painter I'm just a bloke playing in his garage. But um, it's very rewarding if you manage to finish something off to a high standard. You can only do that if you take your time. Now I've been moaning about the colour match on this. The engine bay I reckon looks absolutely fantastic but it is the wrong blue. And I've had to mess around with it quite a lot to get it where I want. From the original blue I've added reduced white, reduced red, I've added a black tint, an ochre tint, Where's the other one? And a mid-blue tint. And it's taken hours to get close in terms of the original colour. Now I know one of the blue tinters you can get is a red blue, so if I'd got that instead of the plain blue, I probably could have done away with the red. So please don't attack me if you see me on the street, because this is an absolutely terrible looking masking job. But it's there so I can just touch prime, or etch prime these areas, and then put a final layer of, um, or a final few layers of uh, conventional high fill. These bare metal areas, if you touch them, you are got to wipe them again. So we need to firstly use wax and grease remover. There's some exposed metal here where the welds are from that plate I put in. So I'll go around the car and I'll use an acrylic uh, etch primer just to go over those bare metal areas and then we'll go over it with high fill. So I'll just go around and give it a good clean. And we just want to dust over the bare metal parts. Now this is just an acrylic etch primer, you can put your acrylic top coat straight over the top but I only just go over the bare metal areas 
and then use a high fill over the top. You can paint on this, but I prefer to put the proper high fill on, and that way you can block out any, use a bit of 600, block out any um, really small imperfections. Now I'm using a touch-up gun for a couple of reasons. It keeps the uh, overspray down, but also because it's shorter, it can get it under the sill a lot more effectively. Another reason I do this is when this all dries off, there's a defined edge between the primer and the original paint of the car, so I can feather that out with a bit of feather that out with a bit of uh, 600, so it's a seamless edge, and then I can sort of blend it all in. I've left some of the masking on here and also at the back uh, because there are still a few repairs that need to be sort of looked at. You don't notice these things until they're all in one colour, and once they're in one colour, you can sort of they pop out at you any sort of pinholes or small imperfections that need to be filled. So I'm going to take this feathered edge out. So I'm just going to give it a slight rub. And the idea is it should be able to feel the edge. It should be absolutely seamless as you do it. Sorry, Miss, you're going to say something? Uh, I've got two things to say. One is you're spilling the whole thing. No, and the other one is we can't see your head. Doesn't matter, I think. You don't need to see my head. Okay. I'm not sure if you're supposed to rub primer with water. I don't really think you are, but when we finish uh, going around the car doing it, I'm going to rub it over with wax and grease, which is solvent based. It'll help the water dry. Now, the idea is you don't want to sand it with too fine a paper because you need to give it a good key for the new paint to stick to. And that goes for the primer as well. You can take it back with six or 800, but I'm going with 400. And I'm going right up the door. So that when I blend it in, it's got something to, to key into. You want everything nice and smooth. It's been dead smooth. Right, so I fit it with the wax and grease. So there it is blended. I've just done it with a small gun and changed my mind. You can still see some marks around here where I've sanded back um, and I haven't blended up that far so I need to um, wax and grease, wipe it all over again. Um, I might key it a little bit higher and I'll clear the whole bottom section of the door. Alright, I'm going to throw down a bit of clear now. I've blended the paint in. These different colours here aren't the paint, it's where I've rubbed back. Um, it's important when you do this to do your long long passes and then overlap with your second pass. That way your wet edge is always kept consistent. So I'm going to do a bit of clearing on here, then hopefully after that I can demask it, let it harden off, colour sand it and puff it. Right, so I've clear coated the car. I've got to let it dry and then I can colour sand it. The, um, the efforts in matching paint have paid off. I'll tell you what, it took me about three hours to get the colour right, but I'm very, very happy indeed with it. Shim this, new mounts here, these aren't new, these are from the chook shed and they're in remarkable condition and that'll just go on there. Um, now this is the driver's side mount so I can't mount this on the engine just yet, I have to wait until um, I've got the engine about to sort of drop into position and then secure this to the block because it has to clear the steering box. 
I was going to try something a little bit different and uh, put the steering box in with the engine in um, but I've not done that before I'm not sure if it works but um, I think I thought I'd play it safe and do it the way I've done before and just hope for the best it's a bit more fiddly but at the end of the day it's proven I don't know it works I made up my mind that today was the day the engine was going back in the car and I thought, well, this inhibitor switch is damaged. So I thought, look, if it's hard to get in after I put the engine in, so be it. So it was a little fortuitous when this rolled up in the post. Engine stands looking a bit naked now. The next bit of work for that is to mount the 14 motor on. Nice and easy to jack up with no engine in. So, well, as they say, let the games begin. Check this out, I always wondered why the passenger wheel would try and self-centre where the driver's one stayed where you put it. It hasn't got the drag link, um, or the tie bar if you like, and it hasn't got the um, ends hooked up. But the reason it's trying to self-centre, I don't know if you can see that, is the hose is elasticising the thing back. Clearly the wrong hose and really, really dangerous. So it's a good thing we've got three new ones to put on. So scared of this coming down, lifting it up from a different place to keep it more level. If you remember when we bought it out, it was sort of diagonal or almost vertical. So we'll probably start to lower it a bit. Alright. We're getting there. Maybe down a little bit more. Now I'm almost up against the head there. Now I don't sweat much, so I'll leave it home now. This is starting to bother me. Next thing to do, stick a jack under the back of the transmission and lift it up. Try and level it a bit. Right, this is being difficult. Lower the front end a bit more. And it's just hanging on the edge of the sump between that and the cross member. And we're in. We've cleared that brake cable well. Oh, gee whiz, I tell you what, I reckon I need a beer now. But the next stage is to, uh, I've got it sitting on jacks and all sorts of things. Um, I don't like all the way taken on rope, particularly an old manky rope like that, but I'll put the mounts in and bolt it up and you know, sooner or later we'll get to start it and hear it run in the car. I've got to get a custom exhaust system made for it um, because the original ones had it, but uh, yeah, I'm pretty pleased overall. So now it's time to tighten the front end up. There are four front end bolts, sort of here, here, and the same on the other side. Um, like anything that needs to be tightened like that, you would do it diagonally. So for example, I'll start here, go there, and sort of do it in a crisscross pattern, just to pull it up evenly. You can't really see from that angle. I'm by myself and haven't got the kids to help me. But there is absolutely nothing fun about doing these mounts from above. And you can't get to them from underneath either, because of the room. This side's horrendous. <clears throat> because of the steering box and you've got the oil filter on the other side so it's very difficult to gain access I'd still sooner do that um, than take the gearbox off and try and put the gearbox in the car later got the other side on but this one you've got to sort of get your hand behind the steering column to your elbow and it is a bastard on every single level you've got to sort of have the mount out so you can get it in behind the rubber part and then start it Time to put the cross member in. Well, here it is all in, and it looks absolutely brilliant. The cross member underneath was really ugly to get in. The auto seemed to be harder than the manuals. Otherwise, it all looks pretty good. There's a few touch-ups, um, you know, a scraping here and that sort of stuff. But otherwise, it all went in well. There was no issue. 
just complicated with those mounts down there. But we're almost ready to start. I want to talk now. I've done the bodywork on it. Um, and it looks absolutely brilliant. The only problem is it's not up to par yet. Um, and it is full of orange peel. Now, if I look along there, if you look at the reflection of the galaxy, you should be able to see um, all the peel. And the reason they call it orange peel is because it resembles the skin of an orange. Now, we have to colour sand that out um, and buff it to make it look good. Um, the original paint on the car is very peely as well. Now, that's what I've painted up to here. I've painted around up to there, sort of blended it in, and I've cleared higher. Now, if I colour sand the repairs without clearing it, I'm going to colour sand all that blending off and you'll end up with a defined line, which is, you know, where the paint is laid on thicker and it's going to look really, really nuts. So you need to clear coat over your um, over where you've blended and that way I can, uh, I can get a good finish, I can get a good result. The other thing is the clear coat serves two purposes. One, it protects where it's been blended and the other thing it does is it's very hard and it gives a good level of protection against stone chipping and that sort of thing but in being hard it's harder to colour sand back now really once this is all buffed out and it's looking good I should really colour sand the rest now it's all original paint there and it's really really peely um, I can do that later the way it stands now it's a great 10 foot car actually it's a good 6 foot car it looks nice from a little distance back but it's not really the result I'm after I want to have it a lot flatter and, and shiny if that makes sense now the other thing I've done is I've put down about four coats of clear, which is quite a lot, but in the colour sanding process I'm going to probably be rubbing out one, one and a half coats to get it level so it still offers a good deal of protection after we've finished. Now, there are blocks such as this, these are great for body repairs to make sure you get the whole surface uh, uniform, not much good for colour sanding, you need a little bit more feel than that. Um, so I'm just going to use a small rubber um, block if you like, and I'm going to start with some 1000 grit paper. Uh, wet and dry paper is what you use because you need to use it wet, you never use it dry, the paper will clag up and you won't get the finish that you're after. Um, these wet and dry goes right up to 2500 grit, it starts at about 80 grit, um, being very coarse, right up to 2500, this just feels like a piece of A4 to touch. Um, I'm only going to go to 1500 and buff the rest out. The first order of business is a nice bucket full of fresh clean water now. This needs to be changed quite a lot um, in order to affect the repairs properly, but you need to put it on wet. Now the first part where you start rubbing back is you'll feel it, it feels like it's just skating over the top of the surface. Now, the further in you go, you'll feel it start to bite in. Now you should get a milky coloured solution coming off it and that's the clear coat. If you start getting blue you know you've gone through the clear and into the colour. Now that doesn't look like it's cleared, um, this top part here, and that's alright because I wasn't intending to do that. And I'm just going to go reasonably gently. Now it's starting to bite in now which means I'm taking the tops off. Now there's a, a story to that because if I wipe that down it should look nice and flat but you'll find when you start doing it You'll have, you'll have taken the tops off, but you'll be able to see the bottoms of the valleys of each bit of orange peel. Now you can't leave it there because if you buff it, it'll look like it's full of humidity blisters. So you need to get it dead uniform, dead low. In the corners, you don't even need to use a pad, you can just sort of work it in the corners like that. You don't want to spend too much time in the corners because you do that, you'll end up destroying all your work. So I'm going over the whole door with some 1500 and you, I'm sort of wiping off as I go just to see where I'm at. Um, I have got a criticism of my own work in that I didn't run the clear high enough. I should have run it straight hard against that swage line, or underneath that swage line. And I sort of blended it at the top and when it's colour sand you can see where it's blended but that should buff out. Um, just should have probably gone, gone higher. I didn't want to paint as much of this car or as much of this car as I ended up doing. Because um, the paint actually looked pretty good. It was just in order for the rust to be fixed um, and for it to blend properly, I ended up painting virtually half the car, the lower half of the whole car. So didn't really want to do that. But for it to look as good as I want it to look, and this is just going to be a clean daily driver, it's not a concourse car by any stretch. Um, but for it to look as good as I want it to, 
I sort of had to paint it pretty much the whole car up to there. Another thing I do, once I've sort of wiped it off like this, I use a dry cloth, a polishing cloth, to take any residue off and have a good look to make sure I've got rid of all the pits and lands and it's nice and flat. Now I've just got into trouble for wearing a good shirt while I work on the car. So I've got changed into a trashy one because I've destroyed about 10 shirts while I'm doing this. Mm. Anyway, <clears throat> clubs. This is above, variable speed here. Um, Stamping in the top is direction of rotation and that must be adhered to. You must always be thinking about the way the thing's turning, or the direction the thing's turning, while you're buffing. For example, if you're buffing down a door, you want to buff off the edge of that corner because if you buff into it, you're going to burn through the paint and it'll look terrible. So off the edge, around the top and bottom, and along like that. Now, when you buy these things, they come with a rigid Velcro type disc. There's a bit of padding there. And a landfill cover. Now these things are no good for cars because when you tie these around, there's only a little bit of cotton protecting that edge from the car. Now, that's all right if you're buffing flat. But if you're buffing into something like this, it's gonna burn through and leave a nasty skid mark right through there and your paint's wrecked. So I never use these things. There are two grades that I know about, there's probably more, of foam disc. Now these are nice and squidgy, nice and compressible, so it's safe to go right into those sorts of areas without it causing any damage. Now, this is a white one, this is a black one. The black is less dense foam and it's better for finishing. Um, now obviously, you would use a series of these with different colours uh, to get the desired finish. Now I'm only going to buff this with a bit of Menzerna. I just want a nice shiny finish. It's not going to be a show car, so it's not that important. Today's warm, so I'm going to put a little bit, I've got a spritz bottle, I'm just going to put a little bit of water spray on there. I'm going to jam the door from above so that those edges are proud, so that when I run down there with the buff, I'm not going to be cutting into the front of the back door or into the sill. I want those edges proud so I can buff off the edges. So it's a hot day today, I'm just going to use a spritz bottle, put a bit of water on, don't have to be loaded up too much. And I'll load up the pad. Try and minimise it sort of flicking around everywhere. Now there's an art to buffing in itself and just running over the thing with a buff uh, won't yield a fantastic result. Now, one of the ways I always look at what I've done is by running a fluorescent light um, over and it'll show up any sort of dull spots uh, in the work you've done. And that way you can sort of see where to go over, the, go over your work um, and it becomes sort of painfully obvious. But you can see the, the difference there um, between the, the door that we've colour sanded and buffed and the back door that we haven't begun yet. I'm going to finish there because uh, in the next video I will have had the car all buffed. I can put the trims back on and, uh, and I can start the engine. I'll get that all fitted out and ready to start. Got to get an exhaust pipe, drop the rear end out, uh, do the front end, get tyres and all the rest of it and then we can go off and get a road with you. But that'll do for now. I'll upload another one in about a fortnight and um, yeah, by then it should be taking shape a little bit more than what it is now. Okay then, see you later.